<laughs> where do we start? Where do we start? Yeah, exactly. Where do we start? With Bismillah, I guess. Hashtag truth. It's a man's world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, SubhanAllah, you know when they sent us the the question that we're mm-hmm. to be discussing, um, this idea of it being a man's world and, and just the whole issue of misogyny, I thought, okay, let me be clever and go and look it up and see what misogyny means. Mm-hmm. And what it means is a dislike for or a contempt for women. Yeah. And that word contempt for me pretty much sums up uh, the attitudes in a lot of traditional cultures um, Mm. and Muslims, unfortunately, included the idea that women are less, that they are less capable, that Mm -hmm. they are less able, they're worth less. Their struggles and their sadness and their hardship is worth less. That they're not even full people. Because exactly, exactly, because they are women by their nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that's something that I don't think anyone can really deny when you look at the way that our societies operate. Uh, and again, it's not just a Muslim thing. I think a lot of traditional cultures have that same contempt uh, for women mm-hmm. as a gender. I don't know. What do you think? I, no, I agree. And I, I wish I could say that I don't think people can deny it because I see people denying it all the time, mm-hmm. especially when Muslim women say, hey, this is misogyny. Hey, mm-hmm. we're dealing with misogyny mm-hmm. here and we're really struggling with it. Yeah. I think there's a lot of pushback yeah. against Muslim women yeah. because Muslims want to believe that, you know, we romanticize women and we want to give lectures and khutbas that say, mashallah, sister, mashallah, you know, where we elevated you, we put you on a pedestal and then we chained you there and uh, yeah. and made sure we didn't listen to you or give you a voice or yeah. hear what you had to say. or And so when we say, no, wait, this is hor- Wait, do you know how many women haven't mm. been to the mosque yeah. In, yeah. in our mosques? I don't know how you feel about the mosque situation and maybe in the UK it's different, mm. but... I think that the mosque situation is an architectural example mm-hmm. of misogyny mm-hmm. that has mm-hmm. that has infiltrated our psyche. You know, subhanAllah, when you, just as you're saying about mosques, I think there was a study done on this or some kind of photo feature, wasn't there, on Twitter at one point. Which uh, and Tumblr. Talking, that's it. Talking about women's spaces. Mm-hmm. And basically this uh, photojournalist went to different masajid and took pictures of the women's section mm-hmm. and... Like you said, if that's not a slap in the face to anybody who runs a mosque or designs a mosque or plans a mosque, to say that we, as half the ummah, are stuck in small, cramped spaces, no access to the knowledge, no access to the khutbah, let alone a screen or a window or anything. Literally, you are shut in sometimes upstairs. Mm-hmm. There's no access. You're mm-hmm. there with children. You're there with people mm-hmm. who have disabilities. And the expectation is you shouldn't want to be here anyway. Right. Why should you care? You shouldn't right. be here anyway. And right. that is so against the prophetic example. It's, it's an insulting. So far. Yeah, it is. Yeah. When I was in, um, in Egypt, one of the things I noticed architecturally, it was very interesting the way that they accommodated male and female spaces mm-hmm. in the historic masajid. And in different cultures and different countries, they've got different concepts. So, for example, in South Africa, if there is a space, it's totally screened off. Mm -hmm. The whole idea of parda is really big Mm -hmm. there. In Egypt, often it would be a level above Mm -hmm. and it's open. Mm -hmm. It's like like a balcony space. Right. So the the wonderful thing about that that I liked, I mean, I went a club, so I don't want to sit in the hall with men. So that's just my personal thing. I'm not interested in sitting in the main hall. But what was lovely about those traditional masajid was that you're there. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And you haven't been starved of that of spiritual beauty. space and the beauty and the atmosphere mm-hmm. that you have in those beautifully designed masajid. Because mm-hmm. when you've got a beautifully designed mosque and the space for the women, they just put some geometric patterns on the wall, but everything else is shut off. And there is no access at all to the knowledge, to the spirituality, to the atmosphere. I just think, well, what were you thinking when you well, put that together? Yeah, I, yeah and I think that... So I think a lot about mosques Mm. because I think that architecture speaks to people. Yeah. And when we bring into a mosque men, women, children, and say to them, by virtue of the architecture of this space, who is important and who isn't in this space, (sighs) we're creating or perpetuating the misogyny. And yeah, as far as that. when I, I was a guest speaker in a mosque in the United States and the people who invited me actually were the kids. So it was a it was a young people. They had invited me and, a, and somebody else to speak and do a whole, a whole weekend of stuff yeah. to bring our youth into back into a spiritual life. Yeah, into a spiritual space, how, into we a spiritual all know safe how important space. This is. Yeah. They had me uh, scheduled 
to speak actually in the mosque mm -hmm. hall yeah. to the kids. And I did that. And then they had another talk. And without going into the whole story, so I'm the guest speaker, okay? And they, the way they had the women praying in that mosque is in a, was in a balcony, but it was in a balcony with a, a very big yeah, wall, so I've you can't see before. down, yeah. mm. with garbage coming out of the garbage in there. And I couldn't, I, and I have a bad knee. Mm. So even going up there, I went up there the first time because I was trying to be polite, and it was filthy, and I was upset, and it was hard for me yeah. because yeah. of my knee. Yeah. So I decided I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to pray in this space downstairs. Yeah. And because I prayed down there, the young women wanted to pray with me. Mm. Well, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it was a large space, and there was hardly anyone there. And there's plenty of space yes, for us. Yes. So the first thing that happened is people started bringing in chairs to mark off our space okay. to make sure we don't take too much space. Okay. Wow. And then the second thing that happened is the next morning for Fajr, because we were supposed to be praying to Hajjid. The women wow. were supposed to pray to Hajjid in the mosque that next day. And then we're supposed to pray Fajr. And I just had a feeling about this. Mm -hmm. So I prayed Fajr on my own uh, before the Jama'ah. Mm -hmm. And when the Jama'ah came, we were asked to leave. Mm -hmm. And so as the guest speaker, I stood outside in the freezing cold, waiting for the prayer to be over wow. so that a car could take me somewhere. And that's misogyny at mm -hmm. its core. Mm -hmm. I'm older than most of the men that kicked me out. Wow. I'm their elder. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we if we were to measure if we were going to stand and start reciting Quran and see who knows more, there's I'm not saying that maybe I wouldn't be able to keep up with them, but there's a good chance I could have yeah. gone much further than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it, all of the standards that the Prophet sallallahu taught us to judge rank, if you like, rank, if you like, mm. were erased, and it was I, my female self. Yes. Can you imagine? I yeah. and there it was. It was. I was so offended mm -hmm. and so upset, and it was just this microcosm of the misogyny that. If now I'm a practicing, believing, devoted da'ya. Yeah. What about the young women who saw yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. What about the men who saw that and decided that that was okay? Yeah. What about the 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 elders? who were, it's just, it blow, boggles my mind. And then you get people who tell you, oh, that's not misogyny, sister. No, that is textbook yeah, yeah. misogyny. I think, I think the word misogyny, I think people have a negative reaction immediately because it's tied to the feminist movement. I think that's the, the patriarchy, misogyny, is tied to Western feminism. And yeah. obviously we know that a lot of Muslims have an allergic reaction to feminism and anything that can be attributed well, to feminism. I, I think they have an allergic reaction to feminism mm. because feminism challenges the privilege yeah. Yeah. that they have held. Yes. And I know that, there's, that there has been feminism that has hurt Muslims in what we call sort of international feminism yes, or yeah. colonial feminism. Yeah, 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 but the word feminism by mm. itself just means a fight against misogyny, yeah. a fight against mm. patriarchy. And while many Muslims will tell you, and I've heard khut, khatib say this, that we have a patriarchal system. No, I'm sorry, we have a tawhidic system. Break that down, girl. What do you mean? I've not heard that before. What do you mean? We, are, we are not Christian. Mm. We don't have a male-gendered God. We don't have a, a male papal system that has taught us forever that patriarchy is the only way to go. The reason that patriarchy, well, there's a lot of studies on this, but my feeling is that patriarchy grew out of the male-gendered God of Christianity. Since God was male, mm -hmm. since God was male, yeah. then men were better equipped to run things. Well, the Christian story states that quite clearly. Exactly. Adam was the was the virtuous one. Yeah. Eve, Eve was Eve. Listen to me. Eve, <laughs> Eve was the one who tempted <laughs> an Adam. I'm <laughs> lying. You're lying, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, was the one who tempted Adam and was responsible for the fall of man. Exactly. That evil woman exactly. who was tempted by Satan, yep. and that I think is fed into misogyny. Yeah, that's course. where misogyny comes yeah, yeah. from, and patriarchy, and Muslims. And that's have... not an Islamic. Uh, that's Other not than an Islamic. No. no, uh, no. Uh, Muslims, well, I feel, have taken this through colonialism and through a number of other things and put it in a big goblet. And they stuck a straw in and they sucked it up and then they said, yeah, this feels good, you know, I like this. And we've we've sunk to this level mm. of jahiliya because that's really what it is. I'm interested in the way that, okay, during the time of the Prophet ﷺ and the early generations, obviously 
you know, the, the Islam, Islam was revealed, you know, Quran is being revealed, the Prophet was teaching. And although you had systems, what I think what would be known as patriarchy, like for example, the man being the head of the house, okay, that's attributed to patriarchy, a patriarchal system. But interestingly enough, they were able to navigate that without the kind of oppression that we see now. For me, what I see in our, a lot of our communities, and I, it hurts me to say this, but I see that the community exists for the benefit of men. Right, of course. Everyone is there Absolutely. to serve male interests. Mm -hmm. If you look at the, a lot of the advice around marriage, as long as the man is happy, we're good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether the wife is not happy, children are not happy, mothers, fathers, anybody else is not happy. As long as that man is kept appeased, mm -hmm. we're good. Mm -hmm. Once he's not happy, someone else has to change. Yep. Someone else has to change to make him happy again. And this is something that really, you know, the whole victim shaming thing. Yeah. And we see it in the advice that is used to be commonly given to women in domestic violence situations. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Yeah. How did you make him it, angry? It, still. Still, yeah, not yeah. used to. Still, I, 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 hope, I hope there's some kind of move now towards acknowledging that it's not the victim's fault. We see mm -hmm. that in the UK. Alhamdulillah, we have more imams speaking out about it. Mm -hmm. But I think generally there is this idea that you must change. You must mold yourself to make him happy. Of course, we have hadith that talk about the pleasure of the husband, which is fair enough. But what I think what you said, the Tawhidic system... It's not about you and your desires. It's about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not about, as a man, am I happy? Right. Is everything running the way I like? No, it's, <laughs> is Allah pleased with this house? Is right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pleased with me as the leader of this house? And I think that that, for me, more than patriarchy, is the lack mm. of, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? It's the lack of taqwa. Oh, in yeah. the way that men just feel, I am where it stops. The buck stops mm -hmm. with me. If mm -hmm. I like it, it's good. If I don't like it, it's not happening. But what about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Mm -hmm. You are, again, responsible to him. Mm -hmm. You are answerable to him eventually. I think a lot of men forget that. Well, I think that on, men on also forget. On a community forget. level and on a, and on a, women on a personal forget, level. And, yeah, and we forget in our rhetoric, too, that uh, women are also answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So? And we're not, and we're answerable to Allah first. And that's what I mean by we have a Tawhidic mm. paradigm. We don't, it's patriarchy. We should all as Muslims yeah. be just as anti-patriarchy mm. as we are anti-shirk. Because the idea of putting anyone between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blasphemy. Mm. But instead we have cultures and, and architecture and rhetoric that, that, feeds on this idea of patriarchy because it's comfortable mm -hmm. and it's privilege giving. It's the status quo. It's about maintaining the status quo, really. Right, and keeping um, power. Yeah, which is, I think that if you human, are, you know, it's human, exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, I mean, and I, I don't like to paint all men with the same brush because obviously Certainly we not. know that there's shades, all shades. Of course, shades and of all shades of women as well. But, <laughs> and shades of women. But I think in talking about, I think something you said that was is important to me in my, the way I'm thinking these days mm -hmm. is this idea that as Muslims, we are so allergic to the word feminism. Mm -hmm. And I've met a number of young women, uh, sheikhat, mm -hmm. who will just talk about the troubles that they've experienced. Mm -hmm. Massages trouble, using the word misogyny without too okay. much trouble. Mm -hmm. But then when it comes to the word feminism, really reacting to yeah. it. And I think that I think that it's fair to say that feminism has been unfair to, to women of color yeah. and has okay. been unfair yeah. to Muslims around the world. But feminism itself is a very multi, it's a nuanced it way is. of thinking. It's, it's, a, it's a binary, not binary. It's a, it's, it, a, it's a continuum. Exactly. There's different stages, there's different levels, there's different waves, you know, and like you said, there is, you know, the feminism that says that men shouldn't even be involved in anything, procreation or right. you know, anything, you <laughs> right. know, and we can get and rid of them. Exactly. They, and if we go back kind of to the roots of what feminism means, I like to say Islam is the first feminism. I agree. <laughs> I agree, actually. I agree. And I think the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for me, he was, and I write this in my book, actually, I say that, you know, by my standards, he was a feminist because yeah. at that time, if you think about it, during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the men were top dog, women and children and slaves, etc. boom, right at the right. bottom, okay? And his life was a slap in the face to every single chauvinist idea. That's Why exactly do I say right. that? Look at the women that he married. Was he a collector of virgins? No, he was not. For a lot of things, yeah. He, he was not. Right. Was he a man who had many sons? No. Not a single one survived him. Subhanahu mm -hmm. wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. And this is a man who used to serve his family. 
Mm-hmm. He used to accept things from his wives, as we know, that many men nowadays would issue talaq for that. Right. What do you mean my wife sent food for my guests and you take that food and chuck it on the floor? Right. This is Aisha. Right. 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 Many men in many of our communities would consider that grounds for divorce. That is disrespect. No, you disrespected me. You've embarrassed me. You've humiliated me in front of my guests. Again, ego. Mm. Again, ego. Yeah. But the Prophet ﷺ said, he laughed it off. Yeah. And he said, give her her haq, which is her dish. <laughs> and the rest he laughed it off. So this is a man who was without ego. Right. A man who was without kibr, without pride. And he's a man who left no surviving sons. He didn't have wealth. He didn't lord it over the people in his household. But mm-hmm. that's the standard that our communities have set for men nowadays. You're the boss. Mm-hmm. You're in charge. Mm-hmm. You know, you keep your women in Control. line. You keep your women in line. You've got sons because everything is about sons. I'm not so much nowadays, inshallah, mm-hmm. but definitely in more traditional societies yeah. around the world. Yeah. This this is what it is. So, I mean, it's so it's just so frustrating. But when I think about when we start to talk about all of these things mm-hmm. and we think about like when you talk about the Prophet and his example, I also think that we do suffer from a mislook at who he was. Mm. And even when, like something where the, we talk a lot about how the process of used to help at home, so right? We hear that a lot. Mm-hmm. And uh, the narration that is most widely distributed, as far as I know, is, mm-hmm. which is, he used to work in his home. Mm-hmm. And it, the, the semantic subtlety there. Mm-hmm of difference is so important because it's often translated as the prophet used to help at home. So I send them. Mm-hmm. And it's when you help someone, that means that it's your duty, but I'm so nice. I'm helping you. <laughs> but in this statement, mm. it is, he worked. This is what I know that it's he used his, to mend his shoes. Yeah. And as he used in, to serve right. his family. Subhanallah. Yeah. As in it's his responsibility, yeah. not as in, Oh, I've given you 10 minutes. Come and applaud me, which yeah. is something we have in our homes, right? Right, right. And I think it, it ties into the idea. And I, I, this is something that I feel very, very strongly about, which is the whole idea of women's work and men's work. Right? Mm-hmm. Now, even if we were to say that a woman's work is A, B, C, D, mm-hmm. what we have in our communities, and I think it's maybe capitalism, maybe a lot of other historical, uh, sure. historical subtleties, but the idea that it's worth less. It's oh, yeah. worth less than what the man does, even though she works harder. And we know that Yeah, mm-hmm. women historically have worked harder than men, especially in agrarian societies and societies where, you know, we don't have all the technology we have today. So a woman's work is worth less. Mm-hmm. Therefore, it's to be looked down on. Mm-hmm. It's to it's humiliating for a man to do that. So we've got this imbalance where the man is here and the woman is here. If a man does a woman's work, he's going down. If a woman does man's work, she's kind of like trying to up herself, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think that's why people get so uppity about it. Because it's like, well, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing mm-hmm. man's work? That's our work. You can't come up here. And I just think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't see it that way. He does not see it that way. It is not recorded in your book of deeds as better or less no. because you earned money and you didn't earn money because yeah. society applauded you for that and society ignored what you did because you got praise and you didn't get praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to judge them differently I really like what you said about the yeah. tawhidic system and uh, going and, back to Allah yeah and if I can add to what you're mm-hmm. saying about uh, work um, it gets even a little bit more I would say precarious and dangerous than that mm-hmm. because what we the other thing that we as Muslims have done is we've taken on this the mis, a misogyny of aqidah. What I mean hmm. is that we have valued what are typically labeled as male qualities, yes. like strength and yes. and uh, whatever, mm, mm, mm. and devalued what are typically labeled as feminine qualities, like mercy and compassion. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the name that was so radical to the Arabs mm. was ar-Rahman. Subhanallah. Which is Rahm on the womb. Yeah, Rahman. exactly. Yes. Exactly, which is if you want to speak in these sort of grammatical terms, mm-hmm. is a very a grammatical and social structure term. It's, it's a very feminine wow. thing. And so if we look at that, and of course we never Billah, do we attach gender to yes. God, but yes. if we're talking about virtue, yes. And what do we see as virtue? Yeah. Yeah. And we think about what is good and what is bad and all of that, our very aqidah has been affected by misogyny. And we should all be very afraid of that. Men should be afraid of that. Yeah, 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 they yeah. should have taqwa of Allah 
and women need to have taqwa. Of, we all need to have taqwa of Allah in in that we've accepted, we've swallowed patriarchy, hook, line, and yeah, sinker, yeah, yeah, and we yeah. think that our system is supposed to be like that, mm. and we don't see how it's affecting us negatively, and really we're losing people. We're losing people of faith. The, what, what makes me shudder to think is that, as I was saying about the Prophet Sallallahu being the first feminist, if you're looking at feminine qualities, gentleness, yeah. mercy, quietness, mm -hmm. uh, being humble with the people, being yeah. kind to the women and the children and the men. Yeah. And I love that hadith where, the, where I think it was uh, one of the men asked the Prophet ﷺ, who do you love the most from yeah. amongst the people? And he immediately said Aisha. Mm -hmm. And then he said, no, 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 I mean from amongst the men. <laughs> it's like, oh no, it's too TMI, too much information. Yeah, yeah. You know, who, from amongst the men? He said her father, Abu Bakr. This was a man who was not afraid to express love, yeah. express hurt, disappointment, pain, fear even, mm -hmm. even though he was the prophet of God. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And this is a man who, from yeah. that humility again, praying every night until his feet were mm -hmm. swollen, should I not be a grateful servant? This is the prophetic example. It's not the pride or the arrogance of chauvinism. It's nothing. Right. It's so far away yeah. from that. Yeah, and what you just said about the Prophet and, and how he said, Aisha, radiallahu anha. And what you said about TMI, I feel like, I feel like that's our modern reaction to that, but that the Prophet ﷺ knew that they meant a man. And he they wanted knew. to tell them And he that. wanted to let Make them that know okay. mm. yeah, that, it's that not only am I going to answer you about who I love the most, mm. because Disney hadn't been invented yet, Hollywood hadn't been invented yet, so those kinds of things that we come up with, you know, with, with this kind of this word, didn't exist. Mm. So they really wanted to know, Ya Rasulullah, you know, is it me? <laughs> And um, the Prophet ﷺ in bringing a woman's name into her that... Her first name. Her first not name. Not Umm Abdullah, mm -hmm. right. not my second wife, her first name. Yes. Which is not even a big deal in certain communities. Not my ah yeah, Ahli. Yes. Um, her name, what he really was doing was making a very in, in important statement yeah. about the value of women in community mm -hmm. and, the, and the importance of women in, in, uh, in, in rank of society. Because that's what they were looking for, yeah. and of course they, you know, then they ask for, for a man, yeah. and he links his care of yeah. a man to a woman, yeah. really breaking everything that any uh, traditional Arab at that time yeah. thought gave someone lineage and yes. power yes. and authority yes. and importance. Yes. Oh, he's related to this woman, yeah. Yeah. therefore. This just it boggles your mind if you no, think it's about it. It's actually really huge. And I think that we've regressed so much from that. Yeah. You know, I've been in communities where it's actually, A, it's shameful to say my wife. <laughs> it's like, no, Achi, like, please, mm. like, easy. My family. Right. Oh, tell your family such and such, you right. know. And certainly first names are not used. Like, you would right. never know a brother's wife's first name. It's right. like, no, that's his is. You know, right. you call her Umm Abdullah or Umm whoever. Yeah. So it feels like the Prophet ﷺ was teaching and teaching and teaching certain messages that went against the status quo at that time. Yeah. And yeah. we have unlearned those uh -huh. lessons over time Absolutely. because they don't fit the status quo. Again, mm -hmm. it's about men being good, right? It's about preserving that power structure. Mm -hmm. And those things that the Prophet ﷺ told us about the women, about children, about slaves, about the poor, about the masakeen, all of that is like a knock on the head for those in power. Right. Hey guys, it's not all about you. The society is not set up for you to be happy, for you to be satisfied, <laughs> for you to advance. Careful, that's going to be really, that's revolutionary. But it was revolutionary, <laughs> that's the point. Right, yeah. is that Islam yeah. was revolutionary. And that, when I was writing from my sister's lips, that was one of the things that I found so frustrating because mm. it was like, when I was studying Islam, it was so revolutionary at that time. Yeah. And of course now, we've had the feminist movement, we've had so many movements since then. A lot of it doesn't seem that revolutionary, but when you look at it in that context, mm -hmm. that, society in Arabia, bringing things like freeing slaves, mm -hmm. like only marrying four women. I mean, nowadays people make a hoo-ha about polygyny or polygamy, but in those days, right. it was like, what? Four? Right. Are you kidding me? Right. Oh, why? Exactly. Whoa, 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 what's up? You know, I right. used to have 20 before. Right. You know, so, so and, and, and her because maher. Because it was an economic thing. And her yeah. maher, and the divorce, and the wealth, and the name, and all of these things, mm -hmm. at that time was revolutionary. And I just think, as Muslims, we've just lost the plot. And I'm not saying that we should be trying to keep up with the West in terms of revolution, but at least 
live true to our ideals oh, yeah. and and go back to the, the ideals the, that yeah. we were founded on. The problem is we are trying to keep up with the West. We, we pretend not to, mm. but all of our, most of our problems are mirrored reflections of Western culture and Western society that we've picked up. And I mean, and from patriarchy to misogyny, mm. if we don't find, and I'm not saying that there wasn't misogyny and patriarchy in, in the Arabian Peninsula, of course there, yeah, was. there was. Yeah, there was, yeah. But the, so much of the way we express it today is so reminiscent of either Christianity or Hinduism, depending wow. on the culture. Mm. And in, we don't, the problem is that we don't take the time to push the pause button and think. Yeah. We just say, oh, this is, yeah, that's it. I'm going to keep going. And the, of course, because of the privilege. And the other thing is there's a bullying thing going on mm. where to speak out as a woman means to really risk your reputation. Mm. It means to risk um, being silenced. It means to risk being buhad, so to speak, mm. and uh, thrown out of places. I think I, I hear what you're saying, but I think the landscape has changed with social media. Mm, yeah, I really absolutely. think the landscape has changed with social media and also the increase of Muslims in the mainstream public space. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that Muslims are talking about now on on ABC, on you know, on Huffing in Huffington Post, etc., they could not have had those conversations mm -hmm. inside the masjid. Mm -hmm. They could not have brought up those issues in right. traditional Islamic spaces. So now, yani, that the aspect of control. It's not really there unless you are trying to operate in the Islamic space. So, for example, if you're a female speaker, mm -hmm. you do know you kind of need to toe a certain line mm -hmm. because you'll just simply stop being invited. Mm -hmm. They just will simply blacklist you. You're, you're right. that troublesome one. So mm -hmm. you're never going to be in that circuit. Mm -hmm. And if that's important to you, then obviously it's going to affect you. If now. Which affects the discourse. It does affect the discourse. It's true because there is, I agree with you because there's this kind of, what Muslims who are practicing mm -hmm. and Islamic and religious, the things that we talk about and the way we frame things. Mm -hmm. Then there's the bigger Muslims who are out there in the mainstream on the Huffington Post and going crazy on TV and everything. And I think the two of them don't really hear each other. Mm. It's like this is two different spaces. So the Twitter space, for example, the mm -hmm. Twitter space that is activist space, which is on the news, which is on wherever. Mm -hmm is not really communicating with the Islamic space, mm -hmm. you know? They're seen as radicals and activists and they're just out there. Like, we're the, we're, we're the conservatives, so mm -hmm. we listen to each other and we don't really have a discourse yeah. across that. that and you, the, what you said about the online world now, this digital culture is so important because it flattens the hierarchies. Yeah, it right? does, totally. And so the, there's a couple of things here. I think one is that those who self-define as conservative Muslims mm -hmm. tend to be really afraid of all things social media. And so they, mm. they kind of hover in the background mm. and they, and there, there's also this sort of arrogant, pardon me, judgmental look at those who are on social media Okay. that, oh no, well, I'm not on Facebook. No, no, no. Mm -mm. I don't I'm have time Twitter. to waste on Facebook. I'm not, I have no time to waste. I have no time to waste. I'm, I'm better than this. You know, I'm, I'm more elevated than that. Mm. Okay. I mean, I hear I hear the stuff about wasting time and I hear the stuff about not wanting to be exposed to that, which is sinful mm -hmm. but i i my i also would say that you're what you're doing in that space then is you're not part of modern society because modern society is the internet i mean you can't yeah. separate get having a relationship with someone here without that internet those different neighborhoods yeah, yeah, whether yeah. we were talking before instagram twitter yeah. and all of this and so if we really want to the, and the misogyny that people are experiencing is very real mm -hmm. And it definitely exists in mosques and places like this. I, th I, th I disagree that it doesn't exist at all on in social media. I think that my, for myself... Well, trolling, for example, it yes, seems to exactly. be very gendered. It seems to yeah. be very gendered. Like exactly. Women are the ones who are affected by this more than anybody else. And, and, and I, I don't get yeah. that. Like, well, right. why is that? Well, and, and just I don't know, but just before I looked at, to that, I for me, I really think a lot before I tweet. And sometimes I wonder... The, do men have to think as much as... And I think everyone has to think yeah. to a degree, to be mm -hmm. sure, especially you're representing Islam. But I think a lot sometimes about what I tweet because I don't want to be cut out of the discourse. Mm -hmm. And so even though I really believe strongly that we have deep misogyny and I believe we need to, we need to solve it in order to keep our Muslims in the faith mm -hmm. and to expand and to deepen and expand that relationship. Yeah, yeah. We need this. I mean, this is not just a, it would be nice if we had time to do this. We absolutely have to face the misogyny in our community. Yeah. We have to face it at the mosque level. We have to face it 
in the community level. We have yeah, to yeah. face it in the homes. We have to face it everywhere. Yeah. I think misogyny, in a way, if, if I could put racism in place of misogyny, I think we'd be having the same discussion, which is okay. that we need, to, we need to acknowledge that it's there. Yeah. We need to face it and we need to deal with it because Agreed. just like women are, and some men are being pushed away from Muslim spaces because of misogynistic practices. Mm -hmm. Some brown people, black people, are also being pushed out of Muslim spaces because of racism that they're Absolutely. experiencing. What, what you'd said before about the architecture of the masjid, Uh, it brings me back to this idea of what we are cultivating yep. in our youth. Yep. And for these girls and some boys, they woke. Yes. They woke. Yeah, absolutely. They get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So because I'm a girl, I get mm -hmm. stuck in that corner. Mm -hmm. And my brother who's doing whatever, whatever on the street, doesn't even care about Islam, right. he gets to go in because he's a man. Just because they, they he's a boy. It. They get it. They get of course it. they get it. And, and that is yeah. going to make, and, and, and I think about young girls growing up in that, even if they're not woke yet, mm -hmm. you are telling them something. You are giving them a Absolutely. message. This is your place. That is, you see, down the end of the corridor and up the stairs and in that little room up there with no ventilation, that's your place. And you don't get to what you said before about the beautiful space. Yeah. Mosques were built to remind people yes. of dhikr Allah. Subhanallah. So when you go into a mosque in, in Kuala Lumpur, oh, yes. and oh, you look up like there and your heart opens and all you want to do is say, you can't help it. Like you have to say yeah. subhanallah. subhanallah. You have subhanallah. to. Subhanallah. Yes. <clears throat> when you are, a, not in Kuala Lumpur, but if you are a woman somewhere else yeah. in England or in the United States and you go into a mosque, what you want to say is, I got it. I gotta fight my nafs you have and to fight firm. my you have feelings to firm it. and fight firm it, it. <laughs> and just keep myself mm. here to pray, which I don't do anymore. I've decided that I boycott all mosques that are disrespect that are disrespectful to the Prophet Wow. And disrespectful to the Prophet mm. means, in my view, that they they disobey him because he said, "La amat Allah min masajid Allah." So don't prevent uh, the servants of God from the mosques. You prevent me from the mosque if you make me miserable. Therefore, mm. you are you are disobeying him. Yeah. And the other thing is that if you're not following the sunnah of the open space. Now, I hear you mm -hmm. about that you have that you were in Iqab, you're not interested in open space. So providing a second yeah. space for women mm -hmm. is definitely for important. women who are nursing and stuff Absolutely. like that, that would like that privacy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But to deny women space in the open prayer mm -hmm. space is to go against the teachings of the Prophet. Yeah. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't go to those places, okay. spaces okay. anymore. Okay. I boycott them. I'd rather pray in the mall or on mm -hmm. the street Subhan because at least no one's... In an, in an American street, in the hallway in my university, no one's going to tell me, what are you doing here? Wow. Get out. Go stand in the cold while we pray Fajr without you. No one is wow. going to do it. You, right? Mm. No one's going to do it. No. But, they, but our Muslim men, mm. and women sometimes too, yeah, yeah, not yeah. just any. No, our, we, we do the policing yeah. thing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do that too. We are willing to say, don't pray here. Even though, just for the record, I'm always very respectful. I always stand in what would be sort of the the space of women if the whole space was for yeah. men and women. I um I'm not uh, you're not going to the front and no, saying, and I'm no. not <laughs> no no and I'm not even interested in causing sort of being a rabble rouser in that space. Yeah. Um, I just I just won't go and I wish and and I wish that men the men who are running these mosques understood that women have money and I wish women <laughs> would stop giving money to mosques. Oh that disrespect them because the money money talks and we are all professional women today yeah stop giving it to the places that disrespect you just don't give them your money give it to a women's organization yeah give yeah. it to your publishing company or mine mm. <laughs> give it to a no really that yeah. we're trying to change the rhetoric yeah find some women that are doing cool things take those the money that you're giving over here give it to them maybe the mosques will shape up maybe. if we stop yeah. giving them the money i think that thing of disrespect is like something that's not really well understood in the Muslim space. I mm. think men, I, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. There are a lot of men who don't really understand what it means yeah. to respect a woman. Uh, and even in our discourse as Muslims, you never hear that word respect mm. attributed to women. Respect mm. your husband, respect <laughs> your father, respect your mother, mm. but your wife respect it's like no it's not about respect be kind to her which is something completely different right. but that That's issue of respect as in this is a person who has worth who has dignity who has is these are all male qualities right and of course your mother 
right. by virtue of the fact that she gave birth. Right. But again, like what you were saying about, you know, the, 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 the marketing, if you like, of gender equality amongst mm-hmm. Muslims is that they'll say that we elevated women, but then we'll immediately in the same breath talk about the mother, the mother, the mother. Mm-hmm. Heaven lies at the feet of the mother. Mm-hmm. As if a woman is a mother by Period. necessity. And that's all she is. And by necessity, she's a mother. And because she is a mother, therefore, she is due this respect. What about women who never are mothers, yeah. who will never be mothers, right. who are not mothers at all? Yeah. And, and I just, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who a khaliq, he's the creator. Who, he creates but ahsan al taqweem in the best of forms. Yeah. So a woman who does not have a child, that was that's the that's the best scenario for her that Allah yes. subhanahu wa ta'ala gave yeah. her. So we can't, because I, I get feedback from this from, from some people who are like, well, she just should. Like, she should marry any Joe and marry and really? have a kid. Oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Wow. Yeah. I've never heard that before. Yeah. I mean, I the really stuff know. you hear when you go around a lot, you know, is really... <laughs> but, um, but, but this whole thing of just tying respect to motherhood, yeah. I think that we as women need to look at that for a minute and understand something. Because the, the ummahat and mu'mineen were not mothers of thank you. Thank you. Yes. anyone. And yet Thank we, you. yeah, Thank you. and yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ranks them mm-hmm. second to the Prophet in yeah. Surah Al Ahzab. And I think if we can just mm-hmm. for a moment, I think just as a as sort of a, a starting point for women who want to make changes, if we can look at that word mother, in it ha- is feminine qualities that are pushed down, mm-hmm. in it are um, leadership qualities that are represented in the Ummahats and what we need. Mm-hmm. And it are a number of other sort of issues about caring. So if you there's a there's a, a feminist, a non-Muslim feminist whose name is Nell Noddings, and she wrote a book a number many years ago about how the the feminism of care. So it's very different than any Muslim has ever heard of with mm-hmm. feminism. Yeah. Because what she says is that feminine qualities are need to be the new feminism. Mm-hmm. whether you are a man or a woman. So she's saying right. that when we, if we don't care about human beings, mm-hmm. that's what that's what the downfall of society. Mm-hmm. And she compares that to the, the male quality of standing on principle. Mm-hmm. And that when you stand too much on principle without seeing people, mm-hmm. you end up in wars yeah. and things like that. And I think that without making any mistakes here, because I mean, I'm, certainly we must stand on principle, but I think that really our fuqa, with all of its rakhsat and all of this, has taught us that we stand on principle and we understand people. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. We really need to care. Mm-hmm. And if we could come to that word mother, I think we can redefine, maybe we call it motherism. <laughs> okay, I like that. <laughs> we redefine feminism in Muslim circles so that men will listen to us because we want them to be our allies. Hmm. Okay, that's super, super important. That's and, super you know, um, as much as I've, I mean, as much as I've had so many bad experiences, as much as I'm ready to forgive those experiences and move forward, I'm not a, we, we, we need to be allies. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he made us put us as allies. allies yeah. And we need to work together to make this change because yeah. it won't happen mm-hmm. just from women. Yeah, I think... The biggest fight that seems to be taking place right now is getting men to acknowledge the pain, yeah. to acknowledge the humiliation. Humiliation. Absolutely. And that word there really is like, all you need to do is just put yourself, in all honesty, mm-hmm. in that sister's shoes. You, for example, when you were told you were not allowed to pray. Yeah. Okay. Or a woman who comes and is being beaten and is told, go back and be, be nicer. Patient. Be patient and be and nicer. Be nicer. And that thing know, about being patient, the... um, it occurred to me uh, last week, I think, that I've actually never heard a scholar giving a man who's having problems with his wife, I've never heard the advice, go home and be patient. Maybe it's a test for you. I've just never heard that advice. Maybe you have. I but believe my I... husband was given that. Oh, that mashallah, advice. that's good. <laughs> the thing is, Women are told that constantly as if sabr is a feminine quality. It's a natural feminine quality. Because you are a woman, mm-hmm. maybe you're supposed to be more humble. Maybe you don't have ego. Maybe you don't have this idea of your izza and stuff like that, which is masculine again. 
It's okay for you to be humiliated. It's okay for you to accept degradation. It's okay for you to accept mm -hmm. your rights being taken away, etc. To keep the peace, right? Even though, even though, like you, the example you gave was a domestic violence situation, mm. and I think that part of that comes from a very widespread misunderstanding of what sabr itself is. Oh. Because really, sabr <clears throat> is not sitting around and waiting. That's not what it is. Mm. Sabr is making the right decision and being able to manage the fallout mm. and deal with the fallout. Mm. So when we say that. Um, Believers should seek help. Sabr was salah. Yeah. Salat was salah. Sabr was salah. What we're saying is those are active things. They're active, right? So you okay. you, you pray mm. and you, you choose sabr. Mm. So in one of the aqidah classes I took years and years ago, the example that was given by the instructor for the term sabr, aqidiyan, so as an aqidah mm -hmm. thing, was so for example, if you... As a mother, find out, a'uzubillah, God forbid, that your child is being molested by your husband. Oh, Now, this happens hey. in our society all the time. Let's not pretend it doesn't. Yeah. It's not sabr to be patient and stay there. That's criminal. Mm. And that's what so many, unfortunately, mothers do. Like, they know mm. and they pretend it's not happening. Yeah. It's sabr to yank your child to safety. Mm. And be patient, have sabr with the, with the social fallout of that. Wow. And I think that that was a real light bulb moment for me mm -hmm. to understand. And many of our imams really don't understand sabr. They, they immediately directly translate it to patience, which is an, patience means inactivity often. Yeah, it's quite passive. Yeah. It's, it's and sabr just passive. is not an inactive, it's not a passive, mm. it's... It, it's connected to salah, so it's a, to prayer, so it's an mm -hmm. active, mm -hmm. it's something that you have to do. Now, sometimes it's going to be waiting, maybe. You know, it depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. You might have you might have sabr waiting for your husband to be let out of prison, you know. Okay. Um, but to have sabr with a hot, something that is criminal, like him beating you, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or doing something to your child, mm -hmm. or... Um, Denying you your basic rights as a wife. No, what is that, Sabr? No, no, I'm sorry. And we've taught men that we're going to be patient with that. Yeah. And we need to we need to help men mm. now by letting them know that this is not going to be acceptable. For me, it's like it's the, the, the sad part of it for me is that when we've set the bar so low, let's just stay on relationships for a minute. Yeah. If we've set the bar for our relationships as Muslims so low. And again, we're, we're talking in such general terms right. here, okay? We're probably talking about pockets of the community. Allahu alam. But if we have set the bar for our relationships so low that we will accept all kinds of oppression and, and misdemeanors, okay, in yep. the name of sabr and in the name of keeping the family together. Mm -hmm. And our society is complicit and our families are complicit and our community is complicit. Basically, what we've done is we've said this is an Islamic marriage. Yes. OK, you kind of do whatever you want and you be patient with it. And we're teaching our children that. Yes. And it means that the perpetrator will never grow. Yeah. He will never make tawbah. He will never change. He will never be called to account in this dunya. He will never grow past this. Absolutely. And for me, that I mean, of course, not the biggest thing, but it's it huge. It is. Because it's, if no one's going to call you out as a human being, you're going to be one way when you're 20. You're going to be pretty much the same when you're 40 because basically everybody around you enabled you your whole life. Yep. So you probably will end up to be quite a spoiled human being. Lots of bad deeds, not that much tauber. And would you have refined your character? No, you wouldn't because nobody called no. you out. Because, and that's reflecting of our patriarchal society yeah. instead of our tawhidic yes. society. Yeah. Because if we had a tawhidic society... We wouldn't allow. We wouldn't we would accept. We would hold people to Allah's standard. Yeah, we wouldn't accept this to, this ridiculous yeah. uh, this ridiculous example of yeah. what we call an Islamic marriage. Yeah. We would demand that better. Um, better. Yeah, we would demand that it would be in this and the process, and yeah. we would be we would be okay with being patient with the fallout for doing the right thing. Mm, we call it for divorce. Yeah. More divorces. I think I'm not going to call it. I'm not calling for more divorces. But I do think that if we have a if we as a community pride ourselves on long-lasting marriages mm -hmm. that are basically based on a woman's acquiescence mm -hmm. and her acceptance of bad treatment. Right. 
it's not something to not something to boast about. No, it's not something not. to you know pop your color about. It's and nothing no. great. And you know the other thing is that let's you talked about the man and his need for toba, and I really like what you said, and I agree with you. But let's also look at the woman. Mm. In putting her in that situation, we're actually really trialing her faith. Oh, big time. Big and time. She ends big up time. in sort of a post-traumatic stress yes, disorder situation. Yes, yes. And she herself, at 50, 60, 70 years old, may literally, you know, take off her faith as, as much as we yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about taking off hijab or whatever. She may just take off her whole faith. Yeah, yeah. So we have really hurt her faith as well by pushing her to that acquiescence. Another thing that happens, I find, and I've seen this over the years in relationships, is especially in practicing uh, relationships yeah, where the man is outwardly very religious, he will use religion mm-hmm. to abuse her. Yes. And to justify his abuse, mm-hmm. or justify his unjustifiable demands or whatever. Yep. Whatever cage he's put her in, it's an Islamic cage. Yes, You're well, better he calls off, it that. He calls it an Islamic cage. You're better off in that cage. This is a cage of righteousness. It's a mm-hmm. cage, but it's a cage of righteousness. So you should be happy to be here. Right. If you're not happy to be here, you're not a good Muslim. Yeah. You're not a good Muslim wife. You're not a good Muslim mother. And you don't want Islam. You don't want Islam. Exactly, and you're going to hell, right? right? So what I think, what you were saying, which is very affecting, is that that woman has had a man come between her and Allah subhanahu wa yes. ta'ala. Because it's not about Allah, it's about him. My husband doesn't want me to do this. My husband won't let me do that. He'll be angry if I do this. He doesn't allow me to do this, right? Yeah. So again, going about the patriarchal culture versus the tawhidic culture, which mm-hmm. is, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala want you to do? What is he happy for you to do, etc.? We're not taking men out of the equation completely. No, no, let's but, have a conversation about but, it. We're a family. Exa- exactly, but, right? Yeah. And, and so what happens in those situations is that the woman becomes so far from Allah subhanahu wa yes. ta'ala. Because her deen has now been prescribed oh. for her by her oppressor. Right. By her oppressor. Yes. Right. Yes. So there is no connection. And if he has managed to do his job well, she will believe this is what Allah wants for her. Yeah. She's obeying Allah by staying in this cage. Mm-hmm. Allah is happy with her in this cage. He's right. pleased with her. Now, the day she becomes woke, yeah? Mm-hmm. She's going to think, Allah wanted that for me. Right. Who is this God? Right. Who is Allah? Right. How, did, how come he was happy for me to be in that situation? Yes. And that is where... Why does, he approve, uh, why does he approve of my oppression? That, that is where the cracks, I think, yes, start to absolutely. appear. And subhanAllah, people can snap. And it will happen. And it, in, in actuality, it needs to happen because she also needs to make toba from turning her husband into her god. Whoa. So those cracks need to happen and she needs to break out of it. And we may have a new sort of sort of... I don't know what will happen in our society, but we need to. Something needs to change because right now, this uh, this this misogynistic existence that we're living in, mm-hmm. and this patriarchal society, is uh, it's really penetrating our aqidah, mm-hmm. our social systems, mm-hmm. our family systems, mm-hmm. and uh, really our chance at a relationship with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. I think it looks like we need to kind of, from what you're saying, we talked about, you know words that in the community are like loaded so right. patriarchy etc and you know for many muslims they do believe islam is a patriarchal system i've heard that said many times and i've mm-hmm. accepted it as well so, okay male prophets male leaders male head of household it's patriarchy okay mm-hmm. so maybe it's something for us to be unlearning in terms of mm-hmm. the language yes. and it, it it seems like it needs quite a rewind back mm-hmm. to the beginning so yes. that when we do teach our children and even ourselves on prophetic principles we don't use the language of the colonizer. Yes. We don't use the language of oppression. We don't use the language of patriarchy, which seems to be what we've kind of fallen into, really. Very, very much so. And even our, like, that's the thing. Like like you said, like, we drink the Kool-Aid. That's an, an American expression. Yeah. I don't know if you know. <laughs> you drink the Kool-Aid. Of <laughs> that we, when, and when we drink the Kool-Aid without self-reflection, mm. that again, is it's just... The only one we have to blame for that is ourselves. We mm-hmm. have to have self-reflection. We're a faith. We're a faith of reflection and time and meditation. And by meditation, I mean you know, really sitting and thinking Tadabur. and Tadabur. yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. Tafakkur, yeah. you know, Tadabur. and really spending time because we know that this life determines the next one. Yeah. And certainly we want to be the su'ada adarin, those who are happy in this world and the next. And we need to we need to really learn how to strip away, as you said, the colonizer's language and the colonizer's thoughts and the colonizer's um, attitudes mm-hmm. and go back to the sunnah of the Prophet 
the what is prophetic. Go back to what is prophetic and not be afraid to demand what is prophetic. Mm -hmm. And to demand it, I mean, we're we're religion of politeness and adab and these things too. So we can demand... And we're ways. using feminine, beautiful feminine qualities. Traditionally that are, feminine right, qualities. Right, that are traditionally <laughs> feminine qualities. And we can demand and, and also demand that some of these feminine qualities are taken on by our men because they need to follow in the, the way of the Prophet. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So what you said there about, you know, tafakkur. And I wonder how many of us personally and within our homes are kind of cultivating that thoughtfulness, you know, yeah. that humility. Because... I remember mm. writing about this before, you know, that a lot of what we do is outward, yes. especially in communities where we're trying to practice. Mm-hmm. We do a lot of outward behaviors. Mm-hmm. We say the right things. We wear the right things. We mm-hmm. go to the right places. We don't go to the wrong places. You know, right. it's all halal. Right. Um, but the internal work is actually much, much harder. Yes. Just one, one, one thing, and this is not a masculine or feminine, but pride. Mm-hmm. That sin Mm -hmm. of a prideful nature Mm -hmm. thinking you're better than people uh raising yourself above people not accepting advice you know all this kind of thing is completely against the islamic character of humility absolutely and but yet so pervasive right (laughs) and but humility is something that you must have in order to reflect because if you're proud Mm -hmm. you you're fine i don't need to reflect i'm good like I've got this, I've got this sussed. I, I'm right. doing the right thing. I know right. that's pride. I know what I'm doing, and it's the correct thing. And Allah is pleased with what I'm doing. But <laughs> whereas, if we take a step back mm. and are much, much more cautious, much gentler okay. with what we're doing, much more thoughtful, I think we will probably reflect more of the Prophet Sallallahu attitudes and the companions as well. Absolutely. Because the companions were people who said, "The day I felt clear about or sure of my sincerity was the day I doubted my sincerity." Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes, so absolutely. it was never a done deal for them. They never felt, I'm good. Right. I've reached the pinnacle. Right. I'm doing all, I've ticked all the boxes. I'm good now. Right. They never had that. Right. They were constantly reflecting, constantly questioning themselves, constantly making talba. And I think it's those less showy, mm-hmm. but more difficult internal work that we're not doing uh, as a absolutely. community and that we're not we're not encouraging each other to do. Um, it's easy to, 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 to put certain things in place. It's easy to tick boxes, but that internal work is, it's, it's, it's a continuous, yeah. it's continuous until you die. We lost that spiritual mm. upbringing somewhere in the 20th century. Yeah. And uh, we really, if, if we're going to be really adamant about forcing something back, we need to be adamant about forcing back spiritual upbringing. Yeah. Because all of these th- topics we're talking about today, we really can't address them without taqwa. Yeah, because that's where it starts. Mm-hmm. Good, be- good deeds come from. And, and the light the of having that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help bring people to the truth of a tawhidic paradigm yes. instead of a patriarchal paradigm. Yeah, no, totally. I agree with you. You know, so, alhamdulillah. 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 It was great talking to you. And we, we didn't fly at before. each other. We didn't huh? fly at each other. And we no, didn't we didn't. Jerry Springer, so <laughs> we're okay. We probably <laughs> ruined the reality TV show thing. We should have like that. <laughs> We're good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Keep the faith.